What would you do if you just found out a planet-killing comet was on a collision course with Earth? According to NASA, space debris falls down to us from our solar system all the time. In fact, we get roughly 100 tons of it daily, most of it coming from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Comets like the one in the film have stable orbits in the outer reaches of the solar system past Neptune and are made up of ice, dust, and rock, while asteroids come mainly from the asteroid belt mentioned earlier and are composed of either clay silicate rocks or rocks with nickel and iron. Most of these meteoroids vaporize in the atmosphere, leaving trails of light called meteors. 500 of these will survive the journey each year and reach the surface, becoming meteorites. Again, most of these are too small to do much damage, but every 100 years or so, we're hit with a meteorite large enough to cause widespread devastation. In 1908, an asteroid roughly 200 feet wide exploded in the atmosphere above the Tunguska River in Siberia, producing energy with the same destructive capabilities as 185 Hiroshima-scale nuclear bombs. The event destroyed 800 square miles of forest and pulverized over 80 million trees and was the largest ever recorded near-Earth object collision in human history. Had it arrived three hours later, the rotation of the Earth would have put it on a path with Moscow. While this 200-foot-wide asteroid had the potential to wipe out a city, every few million years, an object large enough to destabilize the entire planet comes along. This is the overwhelming cosmic predicament our heroes must contend with in Mimi Leader's 1998 disaster epic, where a 500-billion-ton comet larger than Mount Everest races to Earth. By exploring the events in the film, the circumstances our characters have to deal with, and the decisions they make along the way, we're going to figure out how to survive Deep Impact. First things first, we need to understand the full scope of the challenge at hand, as the film underrepresents the true destructive power of the large comet barreling down to Earth, which is comparable in size to the asteroid that struck the Gulf of Mexico 66 million years ago, forever altering the fate of our planet. Six miles wide, the impactor asteroid sped towards our planet at a velocity of 12.4 miles per second, igniting the nearby air into plasma before striking the shallow waters near the Yucatan Peninsula. The energy released had a force 6,500 times greater than the nuclear bomb released on Hiroshima, generating a crater spanning 110 miles that instantly vaporized everything in its vicinity upon contact. This was followed by a shockwave with winds over 600 miles per hour near the impact site. The resulting thermal radiation created spontaneously combusting forest fires worldwide, and vast amounts of debris, soot, and aerosol shot into the atmosphere, rapidly cooling the climate, acidifying the oceans, and plunging the planet into darkness for years. Literally minutes after impact, Earth was in flames. In short, it's not just a giant tsunami that we have to worry about. It's also important to note that comets can travel up to three times faster than asteroids relative to Earth at the time of impact, packing up to nine times more destructive power than their ancient celestial cousins of the same mass. This means that the comet approaching us is already more powerful than the one responsible for nearly wiping out all life on the planet. But don't panic. One year after the astronomer, Dr. Marcus Wolf, confirms the sighting of the comet by Leo Biederman, the soothing voice of Morgan Freeman as President Tom Beck eventually reveals that NASA plans to launch a rocket called the Messiah up into space to blow the comet up before it reaches us. The writers of Deep Impact obviously didn't consult with astrophysicists about how to deal with a massive comet heading towards Earth, as I've come to discover that there are less risky and more effective ways of dealing with this comet than, say, blowing it up. It is my unhappy duty to report to you that the Messiah has failed. There are now two pieces. Both are still on the path towards Earth. But before we get to that, one of the biggest mistakes made by the US and Russia was keeping this thing a secret from their own citizens and the rest of the world for almost a year. I mean, that time could have been used by civilians to better prepare themselves for the cataclysmic event. Don't worry, in the next part, we're going to go into how we can survive as individuals. But first, let's discuss how the world government should have responded to the comet. First off, Breathe a sigh of relief knowing that our first line of defense is the gas giant Jupiter, whose gravity catches much of the planet-threatening debris that makes its way towards us. But if that doesn't work, instead of trying to blow it up or knock it out of the way, we can deflect it by either slowing it down or speeding it up along its orbital path. We can't slow the Earth down, but by changing the comet's velocity, we can make it arrive too early or too late to make contact with us. Easier said than done, but one possibility is through the use of gravity. All objects with mass or energy are attracted towards each other through gravity. So, it would theoretically be possible to place a large gravity tractor beside the comet, and its gravitational pull could theoretically alter the comet's orbital path. We can also employ the Yarkovsky effect to our advantage. Comets rotate as they move along their orbit, just like Earth, and half of it has a day and the other half night, which alternate. 
As the warm side that is basked in the sunlight moves away from the sun, infrared photons are released, giving the comet a tiny thrust. We actually see the Yarkovsky effect at work in the film, with the release of energy from the comet's temperature change, launching John Favreau into space. Therefore, by painting one side black using the world's largest paintball gun, filled with electrically charged black powder, we could use the Yarkovsky effect to adjust the comet's speed. These suggestions would be great for dealing with NEOs that we can see coming a decade away, but if we only have two years or less like in the film, we have to employ a more radical use of Newtonian physics. An object stays in motion with the same velocity and orbital path until acted upon by an unbalanced force. So, we could theoretically ram an impact the spacecraft into the comet, and Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, will speed the NEO, ensuring it arrives too early to make contact with us. We accomplished this back in 2005, over 250 million miles away from Earth, with the Deep Impact spacecraft sending a probe the size of a washing machine down onto the comet Temple 1, which was roughly the size of Manhattan. Given how small the probe was relative to the comet, we didn't get the deflection we're describing, but it gave NASA a guide on how to achieve the desired effect in future, should they need to. This brings us to the solution employed in the film of delivering force to a NEO to alter its path. Being a physics problem, nuclear weapons actually make sense, as they have the most energy. What we don't want to do is strap a bomb to its side and hope for the best. The aim isn't actually to blow the comet up, as there's no telling where the debris will hit. However, we could detonate a sizable nuclear device a few hundred feet away from the comet. Sure, space is a vacuum, meaning there won't be any air to carry the destructive force of the explosion. However, the high-energy gamma rays, neutrons, and X-rays released would vaporize a part of the comet, creating plasma that expels particles back to space and pushes the comet in the other direction. But if the world governments fail us by not carrying out any one of these theoretically sound suggestions, y'all need to. The Messiah manages to split the incoming comet in two, and the crew avert an extinction-level event by ramming their vessel into the larger piece and setting off a number of warheads, breaking it up into tiny pieces. But the smaller piece, which is over a mile and a half long, is still on a collision course with us. Now, as soon as you hear about the comet, leave the East Coast immediately. That's Ground Zero. If you can, get out of North America altogether. Consider hunkering down here in Australia, though it's likely that travel will be restricted during this global panic. If you can't leave the country, head out to the Midwest early and stay far away from water. Kansas will do just fine. When the Messiah mission is first revealed to have failed, the president announces that civilians will be randomly selected to stay in a heavily fortified underground bunker. But since participants have picked completely randomly, you're unlikely to get selected at all. Leo, whose family has been chosen, attempts to set up a sort of green card marriage with his girlfriend Sarah, hoping that'll classify her family as being a part of his family, but it doesn't work. If you want to save your entire family, don't wait for the government to stick you in a bunker. Buy one, get one built for you, or build your own. While the government built massive structures to protect selected individuals, people can be encouraged to put their entire life savings and resources into building smaller bunkers of their own in community and statewide collaborations. Companies like Atlas Survival Shelters have been selling bomb shelters since the Cold War and will construct customized doomsday habitats for half a million dollars that can house many people. And the entire construction industry will no doubt begin maneuvering into bunker and other survival-related construction to meet the rise in demand. But if you only want to protect yourself and your nuclear family, you can buy luxury bunkers from companies like Vivos for $20,000 to $50,000, including ones in a former army munitions depot in South Dakota, billed as the largest survival community on Earth. Whatever you do, make sure it's in a safe place. Avoid the East Coast tsunami and West Coast explosions by picking a middle state like Kansas. Next step is to stock up on supplies and equipment. Secure enough water bottles, non-perishables, walkie-talkies, torches, radios, batteries, medicine, and weapons that you might need to last you several months. Unfortunately, hoarding goods isn't going to be easy. One of the first announcements that the president makes is that there's going to be a freeze on prices and measures put in place to prevent hoarding. So you'll have to build up your supply slowly over the next few months. But don't worry, once again, where there is demand, you'll find supply, with black markets inevitably starting to pop up everywhere. So get whatever supplies you need that way. With a bunker, you're pretty much in the clear. In the film, Leo and Sarah hilariously dirt bike up the Appalachian Mountains to avoid the tsunami created by the impact. But as we mentioned at the start, the water isn't the only thing we have to be concerned with. There's going to be a massive shockwave emanating from the impact site. The accompanying thermal radiation will set much of the nearby vegetation ablaze, and vast amounts of debris and soot will be launched into the atmosphere, covering much of North America in darkness. It won't be safe to breathe the air outside for several weeks, maybe even months. This is why the bunker is an absolute necessity. 
If my suggested government response is enacted, almost the entirety of the movie's events will be avoided. But if they decide to messiah this thing, you can at least wait it out in your own bunker, having survived deep impact.